Hello, everyone. Good evening, good morning, good day, wherever you are in the world right now. Very warm welcome to the wrap up of our second Ocean Decade Laboratory, A Predicted Ocean, hosted by the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research in partnership with the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO. I'm Monica Jones and I'm happy to be back to guide you through the 90 minutes of this session where we want to review the core event, but also, well, not all 31 satellite activities that have taken place over the last 48 hours, uh, but at least some of them and basically share the highlights with you. Now, to ensure that you don't miss anything, certainly no opportunity to engage or share content with others, uh, let's just briefly start by taking a closer look at our our online platform. The first thing, of course, is that you need to be in the live stream to follow the event. And the fact that you've seen and heard me is a good sign you're in the live stream. You can choose the language in which you want to follow our event, English, French, or Spanish, or English with subtitles, all that's available. Now, right next to the live stream, you see this grayish big box, no messages yet, it says, that is the chat. Please use it, please submit your comments, your questions, so that we can pass them on uh, during the live discussions. Now, when you scroll down, you see that you can get a look at the agenda. Now, day one and day two are already finished, but you can get an information on the various sessions. Certainly, you can read up on all the speakers and have a pretty good idea what happens next, so you can plan your evening. Uh, very important also, you see uh, the sign for live help desk. Now, here you can get in touch with our team and in case you have any technical or other problems. Now, when we turn to the left column of our uh, online platform, you see several buttons, the satellite activities. One satellite activity is yet to come. It'll start right after the wrap up. And below the satellite activities, you see the ocean library. Now here you find tons of materials, photos, documents, videos that you can browse through, download and share with others. Please do credit the author though. The most uh, frequently asked questions uh, you also find in the Ocean Library. Now, all of that is only possible if you are on the online platform. If you watch us on YouTube, hello, nice to have you with us. Uh, but if you want to interact, then you can still register, actually. Even now, for the wrap-up now on our online platform, uh, that would then be oceandecade-conference.com. If you're on Twitter, and you would like to tweet about the event, then please do so. Uh, we'd appreciate if you used the hashtag Ocean Decade. All right, 48 hours with plenty of activities, and we now aim to review at least the highlights in the next 90 minutes. So without further ado, let's start straight away uh, by taking a look at the core event. Uh, and first of all, actually, by asking the co-chairs of this Ocean Decade Laboratory about their thoughts. And those two co-chairs are, of course, Detlef Stammer, who is again with me in the studio. Good evening, Detlef. Hello. Good to have you with us. And uh, you remember Detlef, of course, is professor and director of the Center for Earth System Research and Sustainability at the University of Hamburg. And uh, the other co-chair is joining us live from Washington, D.C., where again, it's in the middle of the day. Uh, but he's here with us, uh, Craig McLean, Acting Chief Scientist, National Oce Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in the United States of America. Craig, good to see you. You're looking uh, you. fresh and bright. I'm somewhat surprised, I have to say. 48 hours, so many activities, 31 satellite activities. I think one or two were actually done twice, so that's even more. Uh, and you all, you, you sort of had to somehow catch up with all of that. Uh, Craig and Deadlift, did you get some sleep? <laughs> Yes, yes, we did. <laughs> and what, it, what it are your brief. thoughts? Yeah, just briefly, just enough. So what are your thoughts after those 48 hours deadline? Well, actually, let me give uh, the, you a little bit more thoughts. Um, thank you very much, first of all. Um, but before I do so, let me actually welcome back all those who stayed with us during the call event on Craig's and my behalf. Um, let me actually also welcome those who might be here the first time during this laboratory. I'm pretty sure some of them um, will do this, and I'm pretty sure they will be more eager even than everybody else to listen to our summary. Now, this is a wrap-up of this laboratory, and um, Craig and I will actually start with a personal summary 
Uh, but let's, let me give you some numbers first, um, and I need the first slide now. Um, we actually had 1,300 people registered um, uh, for this laboratory. And I want to show you now very briefly, in fact, from where all these um, uh, listeners, the audience came from. Um, this slide shows you a world map. Um, I hope you can see it and the, you see the continents and the, the green, cir oh, sorry, the circles um, indicate um, the percentage of from where the audience came. You see uh, from Europe about one third, um, a little bit less from North America, South America, Africa, Asia, um, the parts of the uh, Australia, Oceania, Oceania, not so much, but to some extent that's our fault because we started, in fact, when the sun still was down there. And uh, during our core event, some of you might remember, um, the sun came up over Australia, um, the, the rooster in Australia, in um, uh, one of our um, speakers' uh, home, in fact, um, became active and told us, of course, all to wake up and participate in the UN decade, and which we all do now. And so with this, um, uh, let's actually come to the summary. Uh, we had actually four hours of excellent contribution, a very intense four hours, almost without breaks. And uh, let me start before I turn over to Craig, uh, what, what I heard from, from, from these speakers and, and panelists. First of all, um, we, we actually got a statement that we did develop over the last decades um, a, an excellent um, prediction system for the ocean that is being used already at least uh, for some users. It, it's now our task to, during the decade to expand this uh, from the physical part into bio biology, ecosystems, chemistry. Uh, but it's also very important to now expand um, the applications, in fact, to entrain the users to, in fact, co-design um, the, the system. Uh, so co-development was mentioned. Um, develop trust in what we produce um, by the users that actually began, uh, be, be used more broadly um, for various uh, applications. But interestingly, uh, it was also mentioned we as um, the, the team have to understand that the needs, of course, will change over the next 10 years as the, the climate change, um, as environmental changes will take place. The needs of the users, of course, will also change to some extent also by becoming more sophisticated in new uses. So we have to adjust to this as well. And of course, um, lastly, um, we have to improve the system, no doubt about this. Um, we have a basic system, we have to improve it um, from the observation side, from the modeling side, from various others. So I'm pretty sure everybody is now very eager to uh, crack to hear your very excellent summary. Um, let's, let's hear it. Well, Detlef, thank you very much. And thanks to each of the presenters that we heard two days ago during the process of the core event and to each of the contributors that offered and launched the satellite events. Starting with the decade itself, the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development requires us to look at how are we using the world's ocean today, what impact are we making, and what changes do we need to make in the future in order to be sustainable. I think we've covered it very, very well, and I credit the speakers for that, providing us with that benefit. The ideas of, of using the science to inform society is the principal underpinning of the decade recognizing the urgency that we have to deal with how we're treating the ocean and the rest of the planet. Looking at co-development, listening to the users and what the users need, and then designing a science profile to meet those needs is, to me, one of the very important messages that came across here. We did hear during the course of the core event the scientific challenges that remain, where and how we can close those gaps, how we could be developing the kind of measurements. And I use that word deliberately. In the science community, we usually use the term observations, but to the lay public, it really is a measurement, a very high quality precision measurement of ocean activities, ocean phenomena, and ocean components, biology, chemistry, physics, geology, all of that. So we've got, we, we did achieve a very, very good explanation of what needs to be done from the plenaries. We're doing reasonably well. We need to do better. And in order to get there, communities need to be engaged, constituents need to be engaged, users need to be engaged, and to help inform the science community of what we need to be focusing on so we could deliver the kinds of products that the community needs. I think our plenary covered that really well. I think our plenary gave us a good startup in the directions we can go to in order then to launch for the satellite events, which really got down to a greater degree of detail by geography, by subject, and the content was fully, fully enjoyable and rich. Detlef, thank you. Thanks very much, Craig. Um, 
Uh, just for everybody's information, we actually will provide a, a detailed summary of, of the outcome, of the, the messages from the core event, and this will be written down and will be available. Now, um, before we get also to the satellite events, of course, this is a uh, wrap up. This is a summary of the entire laboratory. Um, we will actually show you now with a very brief video um, summarizing the core event for your delight and our all delight. Um, please go ahead with this uh, video. Hello, and a very warm welcome to our second Ocean Decade Laboratory, a predicted ocean. There's not a person on Earth that's not touched by the healthy state of the ocean or the changes that are taking place in the ocean. Essentially, we are developing science for the ocean we want. Not one of this can take care of this by himself or herself. We need to work together. We need this network with this engagement network. For accurate long-term prediction, it is time for us to unify the whole ocean. And within that ocean, it's 75% of all the living animals on the planet. So it's a really biodiverse, really vital part of the world. We just can't be everywhere and sample everything. So modeling is our powerful tool to bring together the information that we do have. It is an ocean world, and there's no way we can escape that. What I deem uh, important for us is to be able to uh, bring information from society into our plate so as to uh, start on a feedback system and make them understand what our worries are. We've sort of become accustomed to the services the ocean provides uh, and taking them for granted, including the uptake of anthropogenic CO2, but um, that's not going to continue. I agree, we have uh, quite a task ahead of us, um, but I'm positive that we can achieve it in educating everyone. It is impressive how, where we are with ocean protection today. I'm talking about uh, AI, big data, digital twins that are game changers. I'm talking about climate and biodiversity coming together. I mean, we share one world and we should share all the data. I, I mean, I think that's most important that we uh, actually uh, support international collaboration as much as we can. Cost sharing is an issue and this, this matters because ocean science can be very expensive. I feel that there needs to be a greater contribution from industry and some of the benefits derived by industry need to be fed back towards maintaining the system and much rich communities who depend on the ocean environment. My name is Chip Cunliffe. I'm the Biodiversity Director at AXA XL, which is the property and casualty arm of AXA. Um, and my role really is to understand how we impact nature um, and to develop tools and really work with the business to ensure that nature and biodiversity is part of our decision making process. It's extremely significant that we actually engage stakeholders and users right from the beginning. We talk less and listen more. We participate in what's going on and wait to see how you can add in our help. I think the decade they should do transformative science. And for the users and uh, for having uh, more societal benefit and support to sustainable development goals. would come back to the, the co-design and the fact that we need to listen. We have to develop trust because uh, people need to trust that our information is useful. And then, of course, we have a much better interaction and communication or, um, I mean, we become a joint group then with the users. The United Nations General Assembly proclaimed 2021 to 2030 as the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, in short, the Ocean Decade. This decade will belong to those early career professionals and they will be in the seats that Detlef and I are holding now, 10 years from now.
Thank you very much. Um, excellent summary. Um, and um, thank you also to, for all who produced it in the background in such a short time. Now, um, since this is a wrap up, of course, we now want to turn to the satellite events, excellent satellite event. And a, th a big thank you to all the groups who actually um, ran those events over the last 48 hours. It's about 48 hours that we um, left the core event. It's now time to summarize these. And Craig and I decided, um, since it's very hard to give justice to all these uh, 31 uh, satellite events, to group them into two groups. And um, uh, first of all, summarize the groups and also give examples of these to map out the, the, the landscape of the satellite events that we heard. And, and so the first group um, will be addressing more the, the uh, future developments, uh, things that we don't have uh, addressed so far in, in the past, and that's really related, first of all, to biology and, and chemistry in the ocean in our forecast system, but also to the users in, in training the users, the co-development, um, addressing user needs. Um, the second group uh, will be more on the technical aspects of the um, prediction system that's enhancing the observations and modeling the um, um, capabilities um, and, and also new aspects in the observing system. And um, I would like to start by asking Craig about his views um, of uh, the, this first group. We first of all, focus on the first group, on the new parts. Sort of, uh, if you want to summarize these, Craig, from listening to all these, looking at the, um, all, all what happened, what, what's your take, what's your main message? What I'm thrilled with, Detlef, is to see how what has historically been a scientific undertaking, scientists pursuing that next curiosity or that next level of question in order to understand the Earth better, are increasingly reaching into communities and user groups to understand what people need and how to apply that information in order to get a result. And we had that in a number of ways, as we see now. I think we made the point during the core event that we're largely well established in the physical measurements. And now we're moving into the biology and the chemistry measurements. And when we start to look at that biology, or biological system, this is critical because climate change is impacting that biological system in a way that is far more accelerated in the ocean than it is on land. And for us to be able to track it, monitor it, and then eventually forecast it is very important to coastal communities. So as we've seen some of the satellite events dealing with geographic areas of focus, some in South America, some in the Mediterranean, some in North America, Asia, the Pacific at large, there are very important biological systems there that we're coming to understand better. We're opening the door to the biology and the chemistry. We're going beyond the physical, and we're trying to adapt and incorporate these measurements into our traditional ocean measurement, or as we more routinely say, ocean observing systems. But we need that in order to get the prediction. We need the measurements and we've seen that through a number of, of the satellite events that took us on a tour basically throughout the world's geography, as you showed in the earlier slide where people are joining us from. That's also where the work is going on. And that's where this, this real challenge comes from. We have a number of subjects that dealt with physical measurement, a number of subjects that dealt with biological. Coral reefs are very important. We had some series of uh, discussions and satellites that dealt with the deep ocean. The deep ocean is often overlooked. It's a very important component, both in terms of marine life, but also the storage of Earth's heat. And as we start to watch, as we measure, the deep ocean heat starting to change and absorb and get warmer, that's a very important telltale about where the Earth's energy budget is headed that has long-term consequences for us. So I think we did a very, very fine job through the 30 plus satellites in highlighting where we're branching out beyond the physical, bringing communities into the focus, and also looking at great geographic diversity as to where we need to be making these measurements, pole to pole, surface to deep ocean. Thank you. Thanks, Frank. I, I really agree with whatever you said here. Um, and uh, before I turn over to Monica, um, I really would like to highlight a few um, of the satellite um, events that took place. Um, as, as I said, I cannot give justice to everything, but I do want to highlight a few that actually are, are important buzzwords that will be picked up later on. And the first one is developing deep ecosystem models. And sort of the subtitle is actually the, the ocean's twilight zone. It, it, it sounds a little bit spooky, but it's really about the, the ecosystems in the, in the part of the ocean where light still comes to down to 100 meters, 150 meters. Um, uh, and deeper, um, uh, so where the eco uh, ec uh, ecosystem models are really important to develop the, the changes. Coral reef predictions and algae bloom predictions are very important topics, again, uh, showing where the uh, uh, predictive ocean really needs to improve also. 
ocean ossification research. We will see that later also um, in, in other laboratories being picked up, um, a, a topic that is of extreme importance uh, being dealt with in one of these laboratories, uh, uh, satellite events. And last but not least, increasing representation in uh, marine research and stakeholder engagement really addresses the need that we that we bring in new communities, that we bring in the users, that we actually expand the entire approach to co-development. Um, and, and so all these, all these satellite events really touched on what we said before and expanded on this. They're essentially developing either um, new projects or um, already introducing existing accepted act actions um, for the uh, ocean decade, uh, showing the rich activity that is already ongoing or is being prepared. And with this over to Monica um, for, in fact, uh, giving us more details on, on the first bunch of satellite events. I indeed, Detlef, because uh, as became clear uh, with, with you and with Craig is that there was so much input over the last 48 hours with those 31 satellite activities. And uh, we actually had a discussion just before we went on air, if it was 30 one or 33, but then again, a couple of those activities were done twice. So yes, over the last 48 hours, a lot happened all over the globe in different time zones, in different languages. So in order to keep track of everything, why don't we just have a quick look at where, what took place over the last 48 hours? So that gives us a pretty clear idea where all over the world people over the last 48 hours were discussing a predicted ocean and one satellite activity you could see it in Virginia in the United States is yet to come right at the end of this wrap up. Um, I said it earlier, all those activities, obviously, it would be a very, very tall order indeed to review all of them. Uh, but we decided to pick out five and try and revisit them together with uh, the representatives who are linked up live uh, to talk about those events. And we start with one that took place uh, in the Pacific Ocean. As you know, it's a major driver of uh, the global climate. And uh, talking of time zones, I think they're about 15 hours ahead of the time here in Berlin. So actually, it's already the 18th of September there, if I'm not mistaken. Five, uh, let me just check, yeah, 5.26 uh, a.m. it should be there. Now, very early in the morning. And whoever is going to talk to us from there probably still needs one sip of coffee. We give you that time so that you're fresh and awake and watch a short video instead first.
predictions are done with the ocean and the moons and the stars and the sun. Science and traditional knowledge complement each other. They shouldn't be left apart. They should always be put together because one helps the other. And if it's too hot, then we don't touch the oyster. We didn't know that before. That's science. Uh, and most of it before was just observation. We've come a long way because we've incorporated the traditional and the scientific information. So now let's hear more about the satellite activity Vaka Moana, weaving traditional and modern science to understand current and future ocean conditions. And let's cross over to Jérôme Aucun from the Pacific community. Good morning to you. So very good to have you with us for this wrap up. Um, so let's start straight away. Can you explain why the changes in the Pacific are relevant, not just to Pacific Islanders, but globally? So as, um, first, uh, good evening, Monica. Uh, thank you for uh, giving the floor to the Pacific. So why is the Pacific so relevant? So as, uh, as you mentioned briefly, um, the Pacific Ocean is a very large ocean. It covers like one third of the planet. And they are very uh, strong and large currents that move huge amounts of water throughout the ocean, that ocean. And it has a huge impact on climate and through it, its interaction with the atmosphere. And because the atmosphere knows no boundaries, even mountains, it has effects on other oceans, like the Indian Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean. So what happens in the Pacific physically can impact the weather, for example, in the Indian Ocean or in the Atlantic Ocean. So that's really for the, the physical part. But in terms of human society as well, what's happening in the Pacific should be to the entire humankind. I mean, we're talking about populations here, civilization, that have been roaming those oceans for thousands of years on those wooden canoes that are colonized islands, one after the other, one archipelago after another. And because of climate change, uh, several of those civilizations and islands are threatened by sea level rise and ocean acidification. So we owe them to help them protect uh, their livelihood again against those changes, and that's why it's relevant for everyone. And and which which parts or which areas are, are ocean predictions necessary and helpful for the Pacific region? Well, there's there's a few areas. So you can start with their um, for the safety and uh, and their livelihood al along the coast. For example, if you increase um, Right now, the, the, the changes in the, in the global climate are making that coastal hazards are becoming more frequent and more severe. But if we have better ocean prediction, we'll be able to have better early warning systems to help save lives uh, on the shores of those Pacific islands. And those better ocean prediction will also help um, preserve the livelihoods of those, of those islands through uh, improved sustainable uh, fisheries, whether they're coastal or offshore. If we have better ocean prediction, we have better knowledge of how much fish is available to fish, when should be uh, protecting, should we be protecting air, marine areas to preserve the fish stocks, uh, whether it's offshore for tuna, for example, or whether it's coastal for reef fishes. Uh, uh, Jérôme, in this, in this brief video, it became also very clear how important it is uh, to bring together science and traditional knowledge uh, of the population there. How do the two complement each other? How does this uh, intertwine? So, for example, um, as Craig mentioned earlier, observations are key for both prediction and understanding uh, the ocean. And uh, the Pacific is dotted with many islands. And even those physical, physical measurements that are standards everywhere, they're not always easy to have uh, on those Pacific islands. So in many places, uh, when those modern observations don't exist, we have no other choice but to rely on traditional observation, local observation of phenomena that occurred in the past or in the, in the present. And I'll give you an example, for example, that we can use as uh, ecosystem indicators of, of changes that are occurring over there. 
So, for example, the Pacific Islanders, they will, they will note when uh, turtle nesting happens, and depending on when it happens during the year, that can give us indication on changes in our uh, regional climate. There will be also be, for example, the first witnesses of or bleaching events that are due to high temperatures, and they will know better, uh, and they will be able to follow the, the recovery of those coral reefs. And, and those that no local agent is inaccessible right now to most uh, uh, modern observation systems. And uh, very importantly as well, um, if you understand the tra traditional practices of the Pacific Islanders, uh, that will allow modern scientists, modern, modern science practitioners to better tailor those uh, products. And we really saw that uh, during our event in the Solomon Island, where uh, a, young, a young ocean professional managed to, to find ways to, to warn uh, the population based on modern, modern products, modern prediction, but using more traditional methods uh, like uh, Pidgin English or, or flag systems in remote islands to warn them of dangerous conditions when they go right. about. Well, it just shows, and that uh, actually fits in wonderfully with what we've heard previously. Uh, we have to listen more, and certainly also listen to those yes. with traditional knowledge. Uh, Jerome, let's just leave it here at that moment. I know that you'll rejoin us again for the Q&A session once we've spoken to all the other uh, satellite activity uh, representatives. And for everyone out there, Keep your questions coming in. If you have a question for Jerome, now is the time to type it in and submit it so I can pass it on later on. And that takes us already to the second satellite activity, and that was focused on engaging stakeholders in decade programs. Now, over half of the endorsed decade programs involve ocean observing, and it's critical that we execute effective stakeholder engagement strategies by the end of the decade. The event that we're going to talk about now aimed to start that process with program leads and interested parties. And I'm uh, speaking to a very interesting person now. Certainly, the location is very interesting. He's on a ship. He's on a ship. Nicholas Rome, Consortium for Ocean Leadership. Uh, where exactly are you right now? Thanks, Monica. I'm in the Puget Sound in the Pacific Northwest of the United States. Okay, okay, so we, we can sort of locate you there. So just in case the signal disappears, we know why. Uh, you're nowhere near the Bermuda uh, Triangle, it's something else. Uh, uh, so let's quickly get to, so what, what was the event uh, about? Tell us briefly about it. Thanks, Monica, it's an honor to be here. Um, so our event, I think it goes without saying how important it is for us, the doers of the decade, to engage with society you know, beyond our own scientific communities. And that's what our event was about. Uh, we actually produced a paper in 2019. We had a, a global Congress, a decadal event called Ocean Ops 19 that brought together 1,500 participants from over 70 nations. Um, and one of the papers that we published was a step-by-step -step process on how to effectively engage stakeholders, uh, specifically within the US Integrated Ocean Observing System. Uh, but we felt like this could provide a model for other decade programs. And when we looked at the endorsed programs, we found that two thirds of them involved ocean observing. And so we reached out to the representatives of those programs to give us an overview of their stakeholders and what their engagement strategies are. Uh, we heard from 12 of them, which was especially impressive given how busy people were with all of the satellite activities going on in this laboratory. Um, we took that information from, from those talks, and then we went into breakout sessions to identify what are the common challenges and opportunities, and how can we address them across all of the decade programs. Uh, we had fantastic global participation. We produced actionable recommendations for the decade organizers. Uh, it was wildly successful, and we, and we just want to thank the organizers for giving us this opportunity. So, so what, are, what are the key challenges uh, that you heard about when it comes to uh, engaging stakeholders in ocean observation? Yeah, so at, we had regional, national, global representation at our event. And I think one of the common things we heard is that there's a lack of inclusivity. Uh, it's not by design, but it's just because it's difficult and it requires us stepping out of our scientific bubbles 
communicating effectively about the importance of ocean information that impacts lives and livelihoods. Another really important consideration is that sometimes just the local realities don't match the global ambitions. And I think that's really important at, you know, at the UN decade level to be considering. In, in many cases, the technology advancements are outpacing training and we have to be better at building that capacity. Another challenge is that stakeholder engagement has to be sustained and iterative. It can't be a one-off, check the box, and then you're done. Um, and then finally, I would say it's critical that we cast a wider net. Right now, there's stakeholder fatigue and relying on the same people. And we should consider how we can work across all of the decade programs to effectively reach those common stakeholders. This is a challenge that we need to address over the decade. Indeed. And uh, I mean, uh, talking about the decade, last question, I mean, what, what would you say are the opportunities if that, that vision, if we like, to engage uh, all the end users as well, fully engage them across the decade programs? What's the opportunities? Yeah, so based on our, on our discussions, you know, it's about conducting that joint research, that co-design uh, and capacity building to ultimately strengthen ocean literacy. And in other words, we, this is translation and interpretation of ocean information and its impacts at the most fundamental level. We are the keepers of the ocean information and we are the doers of the decade. And if we can engage society to become our champions, it'll ultimately improve our chances at success. And what we learned in our event was that we have to do this together. It's not about our individual programs. We're only successful if all of us are successful. All right. Well, uh, Nicholas, thank you so much uh, for sharing the highlights of this uh, satellite activity with us. And of course, I hope that the connection uh, stays. Uh, so we have you back as well for the Q&A session. So please send your questions uh, to Nicholas as well via the chat. And we move on very swiftly to the next uh, satellite activity, which was entitled Ocean Predictions and Observations in Response to the Climate Emergency. Well, this uh, satellite activity was showcasing the link between ocean observations, climate models and climate services, highlighting their importance for decision making and for responding to the climate emergency. Uh, but we can hear so much more about this now from Mark Ronald Payne Larson, Scottish Association for Marine Science. Uh, Mark, can I just say Mark or do I have to say Mark Ronald? No, you can, you can call me Mark. Mark, okay. <laughs> oh, I just want to be polite and want to do the right thing. Okay, uh, Mark, uh, your satellite event discussed ocean predictions as a response to the climate crisis. Um, that's a rather unusual link to make. How do you see this working exactly? Thanks for the question and thanks for the invitation to come and talk. Um, I should start actually by pointing out that I'm from the Danish Meteorological Institute but in the, the spirit of the ocean decade, this um, our satellite event was actually hosted at, by from Scotland and involved speakers essentially from all around Europe um, and as part of a larger consortium. Your question's a very good one. And the, the logic, when we start to think about and commonly hear about responses to the climate crisis, we, we start to think about pictures of windmills and of green energy and green transition. And in the terms of the IPCC, these are all mitigation activities. How do we minimize the damage to the ocean and to our planet and to our climate? Um, but of course, that, that's only part of the equation. And it's really, really important to remember that the IPCC also emphasizes time and time again that we need to adapt to the changes that are going to happen as well. Even if we achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement, for example, and limit climate change to 1.5 degrees, we're still facing a near total loss of tropical coral reefs around the world. We're still going to be facing at least half a meter of sea level rise by 2100, and perhaps as much as three meters by 2300. We're still going to have changes in the productivity and the distribution of species. We're still going to have problems with ocean acidification. And so we, eat, we need to adapt to these changes just as much as we need to mitigate the effects that will be even worse if we don't take action. Um, so our logic was that by we can start to use the new tools that we have in ocean predictions and ocean measurements 
to actually come together and start to predict, foreca make forecasts, not just of, of temperature and salinity, but of, of fish distributions, of productivity, and things that people can actually make direct decisions based on, and thereby we can actually start to adapt to the changes that are coming because we can foresee them. So what exactly is the most important thing that needs to be done in order to make that happen? I would argue the most important thing that we need to do is we need to link up our science and we need to take all these disparate disciplines within science, uh, ocean observations, climate modeling, climate science, but also things like marine biology and our understanding of, of how organisms respond to, to variability in the ocean. But we need to go further. We need to go and think about the sociological effects. We need sociologists. We need anthropologists. We need to understand how people make these decisions. We need economics and economists to place value on those decisions and the value of the forecasts. And then we actually need to take all of this and then link it up to society. Because at the end of the day, it's a society that actually needs the information that science can provide. So this shouldn't be driven by the science. This should actually be driven at the end of the day by the needs of society. So we, we really need to work in this multidisciplinary and transdisciplinary mode where, where all of these different aspects are actually brought together in one incredibly powerful tool. Now, if society needs to, to get all this information and when we live in a media age, I myself work at a broadcaster, do you think that perhaps we can, can expect something like fish forecasts uh, on TV after the weather forecast? Is that the way to go? I, I, I like the idea. Um, I've, I've had a go at making weather forecast, uh, fish forecasts myself based on weather, the way the weather forecasters do it. But I, I, it wasn't that riveting, unfortunately. Um, but that being said, that, that's essentially what we, we need to do. And we, we're starting to see very good examples in, in Australia, for example, and many other places around the world where these products, these fish forecasts, are actually being delivered in an operational manner in the same way that meteorological forecasts give warnings and start to deliver forecasts. So although I don't think we're going to quite see um, people like myself standing up in front of a blue screen on the nine o'clock news, I, I do see that this is going to be very much a part of our future. Well, I look forward to that. <laughs> Mark, uh, thank you so much. Uh, and of course, you are also more than invited to join us uh, for the Q&A session uh, shortly. Uh, we still have two more satellite activities uh, to revisit. So see you in a bit. And please, everyone out there, if you have a question for Mark, make sure you submit it on our chat. Uh, this is actually a good moment. Uh, I mean, we have five satellite activities, so we don't have a clear half time after three, perhaps because I could see Craig. I have a preview monitor, so I could see his reactions to those uh, three short revisiting uh, satellite activities. Very interested. I think he even took down notes. And I'll, of course, I can see Detlef. Uh, so Craig and Detlef, uh, your thoughts after what we've heard so far? Well, actually, um, we, we will think ahead. Um, and so we actually will come back now to the second um, group, um, thinking about that group now. Um, <laughs> And, and so this is related to, as I said before, more the technical aspects of the, um, uh, of the pr prediction system. And without any ado, I actually would like to give, pass the word right to Craig, um, since he took notes and has more ideas. Um, uh, your views about um, this part of this group of the satellite activities, what you have seen. I think we're really reaching the, the goal that we're seeking here when we listen to what the satellite groups have been describing, where, and, and I think I, I do need to reach back because I think Nicholas said it very, very well. It's probably because he was sitting on a ship while he was speaking to us. But, but really describing the full integration of, of the science uh, chain of events or, or the logic train that we follow, going from the measurements and the observations all the way through to the modeling, the analysis, and then being able to deliver a result. But as we looked at the physical uh, components and the technical components, there are terms, and we're going to hear this again very shortly, but the idea of a digital twin, having an expert model that can really capture the process of Earth, biology, chemistry, physical, and, and the like, and then be able to look at what that future will deliver to us. Looking at how we will be mapping the ocean, there were several satellite events and one yet to come on, on mapping of the ocean. And also the observing methodologies, the measurement methodologies that we're using, um, but perhaps most importantly, how each of these is getting out of their own 
isolation as a community and working with the larger community that these observations, that these measurements, that these predictions are going to be making. And we saw that in a number of, of these individual um, offers. Um, I am taken too by how the satellite events showed where the regional priorities might differ. We've had regional uh, satellite discussions from several countries in South America. We've had the Pacific Islands, and we also just heard from Jibum on, on the, the needs of the Central Pacific area as well. European, North American, Asian. We, we see that there are commonalities, but there are also distinctions of what we need in both the forecasts and the needs of the people in these regions. I think a common denominator, and, um, and we ended with that with Mark's comments, uh, which we could return to, but the climate crisis is really driving a lot of the attention to oceans, which prior to the decade, and prior to the recognition of the climate crisis, we did not have enough global attention on ocean issues. Detlef, that's, that's my takeaway from, from the remaining satellite components that were physical and also process oriented. Yeah, absolutely excellent and I uh, completely agree. Uh, let me be uh, again a little bit specific before we actually get into two examples that uh, we will um, hear more about. And, and so if I look actually at the satellite events that took place in this, in this group, what sticked out to me was the, the deep ocean observing for predicted ocean. Um, uh, maybe not many of you know that, that we actually have an excellent observing system, but um, in the past it was uh, the top 2,000 meters of the ocean if you want to monitor the heat content change in the ocean. Of course, um, the part below matters as well, and so we have to really go there and measure uh, these changes as well as, as carbon changes, uh, among other things. Uh, modeling and prediction, predicting ambient sound. Um, again, a buzzword that will be taken up um, uh, later on. Um, sound can come from nature, sound can come from us, and in fact disturbing also the ecosystems or uh, the marine mammals. And so predicting this, or maybe in fact, uh, if we want to develop a, a sustainable world, of course we have to take care of this sound um, that does not uh, perturb um, the, the ecosystem anymore. Um, Data information sharing, we heard that from Mojib um, before from the summary of the core event, um, absolutely true. We really need to get much more uh, aligned there um, internationally um, that data and uh, the problem is global, the data have to be global, global and shared as well as the information that we produce. Last not least, sea level rise. It, it's actually it's a, it was a satellite event for Europe, but uh, we heard that from the um, tropical Pacific, um, um, uh, and it's, it's a very excellent example of, of um, a predicted ocean uh, where the uses come in immediately. The, the sea level rise, of course, matters uh, for the low-lying island um, in the Western Pacific, where people really want to know when they might need to move or, or raise their houses or whatever. Uh, and so again, a very excellent example that is just an example, and of course we need much more of these. And with this, um, over to Monica again, and we want to see and hear more um, details of two satellite events that um, Monica will Absolutely. introduce. Absolutely. Thank, thank you, Detlef. Uh, and I hope you're still all open and can take in more because there's much more uh, exciting uh, satellite activities to come. The next one focuses on uh, co-designing an integrated ocean observing system to increase prediction capabilities. And this satellite activity, we hoped to be able to speak to Emma Heslop. You maybe remember her from the core event. She had, unfortunately, uh, the connection wasn't uh, that good. We lost her, and sadly, we couldn't establish it well enough uh, for this review. She's program specialist, uh, Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO. Would have been nice to have her, but Emma uh, made sure that we do have adequate replacement, uh, David Legler, he is Director Global Ocean Monitoring and Observing Program at NOAA's Oceanic and Atmospheric Research. Uh, David, it's so good of you to jump in and be with us, but of course you also know about this particular satellite activity, so could you please summarize the UN Decade Endorsed Programs you highlighted during that uh, satellite event? Sure, Monica, thanks so much for the opportunity, um, and uh, I'm sorry that Emma couldn't be here. We had two wonderful sessions and we, we revol our discussions revolved around this idea of code design. And in order to enable that full suite of co-design from 
uh, measurement to delivery of services and knowledge really requires a lot of complementary activities captured in these programs. The first is the Ocean Observing uh, co-design project, which is sponsored by the Global Ocean Observing System, or GOOS. And that's intended to transform our observing system, the assessment and design process so that we can have a more efficient and effective observing system. We have a Coast Predict program, which is gonna revolutionize the global coastal ocean observing and forecasting systems. We have another program called 4C from the Ocean Predict community, which is gonna advance our prediction capability for the ocean. And finally, we have a project called Synovs, which is gonna kind of span a lot of those uh, programs providing connected tissue in terms of evaluation tools and, and other things we'll need to knit all those programs together. Uh, and how will they be transformational for the ocean decade? And maybe too, too many cooks in the kitchen, how will they work together? <laughs> well, this is a challenging, uh, uh, a challenge for us, Monica, and we've been discussing this. We really think that these co-design focused programs really have to be closely linked and in order to enable this uh, to better link, again, those measurements, the forecasts, and we've talked about the data access tools, digital technologies to deliver actionable information and even to go as far as, you know, how do we best and deliver uh, services, which we thought of as defining as data, information and knowledge that's gonna be accessible and leads to actions. And to also think about those services by, by other groups that can enable and really provide two-way interaction and exchange so that we can have the systems we, we develop to enable those services and people can take action by, based on the knowledge we provide. Now, talking of people, I mean, how, how can they engage and what is there actually for them to contribute? Uh, we had some great ideas and excitement uh, expressed in terms of engaging in these activities. We think that there are great opportunities for our uh, a number of institutions and others to align their activities and contribute towards our objectives. We had some great suggestions from our early career professionals on making this these activities more attractive. And we have a number of activities and ideas already envisioned in our minds uh, in the next coming year. And we envision that there will be lots of opportunities to, for, a non, for a range of actors to participate in our activities. Now for all those who could not participate in your satellite activity in, in, in particular, uh, if you could put it in a nutshell, what is it that we need to take away from it? I, I, I think, Monica, that we're really at the cusp of, as, as many of you have noted here, we're at the cusp of transformation. Technologically, we have a lot of observing capabilities and more technologies are on the way. Our ocean models are doing really well and they're maturing rapidly and we're ready to scale up. So organizationally, we're, we have the building blocks to be really global, to be a driving force for the pressing, to address the pressing needs of society. Uh, we just need some focus, we need some resources. And I think the UN Decade and the UN Decade programs we're talking about are poised to take action and really deliver on some of the challenges that have been highlighted here, whether it be for the current the climate crisis or the lobstermen in our coast who are trying to figure out how to sustainably provide the food that we need. All right, well, David, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to bring this satellite activity closer to us. And I believe you will also join us for the Q&A session, which uh, we will start after the next satellite activity that we'll review. Um, and that topic actually takes us uh, to Israel because it is entitled Tel Aviv. Is it a digital twin ocean city? Now, and you probably now may wonder, Israel, Tel Aviv, Germany, Spain, how does this work? Well, you can be in Germany and in Spain and still have a satellite activity that focuses uh, on a topic that is taking place in Tel Aviv. Martin Visbeck joins us now. He is Professor of Physical Oceanography, uh, Geomar, at the Helmholtz Center for Ocean Research, Kiel and Kiel University. Good to have you with us, um, Martin. Um, how do you think will the digital revolution improve our ability to improve ocean forecasts and scenario generation? Well, thank you very much, Monica, for giving me the opportunity to actually speak about the event uh, that is about Tel Aviv, is it a digital twin city, but also to others that are come in that same topic, that is the digital revolution upon us. 
We had a wonderful hackathon organized in the Cape Verde Island with an African contribution. And I witnessed the students that already three weeks ago started to work on this and they came up with some solutions how we can actually use digital information forecast system for sustainable fisheries, for sustainable solution in West Africa. Very exciting using that digital technology. The second one uh, this morning actually was about the blue economy and digital twins of the ocean. And that I've already mentioned that digital twins and also Crake. And digital twins are really an exciting opportunity to really take the observations, the data that we have, marry them with prediction systems, and then look at the situation of the ocean today and looking forward. And in particular, Tel Aviv was a great example. We learned from the colleagues there how they're observing the environment around the city of Tel Aviv and how that information will become critical for spatial planning about the city of Tel Aviv. And they just took that as an example. And we discussed other cities like Tromsø in Norway, which is very much involved activities around New York that you might be aware of and so on. So it was really exciting to see these three events working together taking advantage of that digital revolution, the digital excitement. And as you said, Monica, we can have events that happen in Spain and Germany and Israel at the same time, electronically networked, we know this now, and it was really fantastic. Four lessons that came out. First, I think it's clear that the ocean community should fully harness the digital opportunities. And I think we saw some great examples in that side event. But second, and we heard that before, it's the sharing of information, it's the sharing of data for all sorts of purposes, which is really critical to enable that innovation that we want to see. Now, all of this comes down to how can we make an ocean that we can only maybe swim a little bit outside and on the top of transparent and visible. So that is the prediction, the observing system need to be visualized. So that was a big topic that we discussed in particular in the morning with the blue economy sectors and with some of the private sector. But I think finally, this digital twinning is all about future planning, about the future actions of human and the ocean, and how we can make this rewarding on the one hand to support prosperity from the ocean for humanity, but also safe, that we save the environment that we have and all of it needs to be informed by decisions, data, forecast system and digital twins are one of those opportunities. Right. Uh, Martin, I'm still somewhat puzzled. Can you please uh, just sort of briefly clarify what is a digital twin of the ocean? Yeah, fantastic, Monica, and thanks for that question. So I think a lot of people wonder about that. What is that? If you're an engineer, that issue about digital twinning is well known for you. It, we have things like airplanes, cars, ships, and the industry develops digital versions of airplanes, cars, ships, and uses them to optimize the design. So that's a well-known phrase in the engineering community. But really only recently, over the last three or four years, we're becoming to think about, well, we can also build a digital replica of the environment. So think of a digital twin earth, digital twin atmosphere, digital twin city, digital twin ocean. So these are digital replicas of the real thing, supported by data from the real environment, supported by models that capture the essentials, and these digital replicas, we can then ask what if questions. How would the ocean recover if we stop harmful fishing? How would the ocean uh, be, be affected if we increase the pollution? How will sea level rise change the coastlines? These are what if questions. We cannot see it today, but we want to see what the future does. And that is where this digital twinning brings our possibilities to life. We've seen it with Earth system models for climate change. The what if question is, how will the planet look if we admit CO2? We talk about the climate emergency now. These ideas are born out from these digital twinning activities, but we can do so much more with digital twins for solutions, for carbon uptake of the ocean, for protecting ourselves against sea level rise, and for really managing the ocean space in a much more sustainable way. So it's a fantastic right. new technology in that arena. And just to make sure, the digital twin is not the real product. So when you talk about a digital twin of our planet, there is no planet B. We really have to take care of this one and use the twin only to learn from it. Uh, Martin, don't be angry. Time is up. I know there's another question, but 
we still have the Q&A session. And before we lose Nicholas on the ship uh, or the others, I would like to uh, jump into the uh, Q&A session now because we actually have already some questions also from our participants. So I would like to welcome back Nicholas Rome, Mark Ronald Payne Larson, uh, David uh, Legler and Martin Fisbeck, of course, as well as Jerome Aucan. So they're all here. Uh, so good to, good to see you all back. And uh, I just open this Q&A now with the last question that I would have had for Martin, uh, Martin Fisbeck about the digital uh, twins of the ocean uh, and that project. Uh, perhaps briefly, the stakeholders. I mean, which ones are essential for the generation and uptake of digital ocean scenarios? Well, thank you very much, Monica. And I think that is really the most important element that we learned from our side events. So who are critical stakeholders? On the one hand, we had great interventions from the private sector, from the industry, because they have a lot of experience with that. And what is exciting, they're very interested to using these digital twin technology to reduce their impact on the environment because they're seeing that they want to use the ocean more in a sustainable way. So that was exciting to see. The other stakeholders, uh, you and me, Monica, it's the citizens of the world that somehow want to explore and understand more about the ocean. And there we discussed in a big way, first of all, how can the citizens and NGOs, the environmental community benefit from them, but also contribute. So this idea about citizen engaged science, contributing information and data through technology to these digital twins. So imagine you're on the beach, you find something odd, you take a picture of it, you put it in the system, you guys, what is it, what do I see? Maybe you are a diver or a sailor, you take observation of the ocean and they feed back into our understanding. So it's the citizen enhanced science that was a big stakeholder there and obviously governments for the planning purposes and the scientific community. All right, thank you. Thank you, Martin. And uh, let me jump straight away in, into the chat and, and start with the very first question that we have here, which is for David. Uh, David, here's a question for you from our participants. How can we inject into this massive bottom-up movement of the UN Ocean Decade some elements of a co-designed value chain, turning the whole multitude activities into a more end-to-end -end system? Oh, well, that's a great question, Monica. So in, in our mind, that's, uh, that's exactly what the co-design uh, efforts that we're trying to describe are, are trying to do is to provide and enable the connections uh, to, to make the demonstrations, first of all, and then lastly, to make sure that after those demonstrations, we have the necessary infrastructure and processes in place that we can do that uh, institutionally and also in perpetuity. So in my mind, those are some necessary steps I think would be a good way to sort of approach this. And that's kind of our thinking is, let's do some examples and then we can build, learn our lessons and build out that infrastructure. Brilliant. If any of the others would like to add, by the way, something, just because a question is addressed to one person doesn't mean the others aren't allowed to also say something. So you just make clear that you want to say something. And obviously, uh, I hand over to you. I would like to, ha I certainly have a question for, for I think, for Nicholas, uh, because uh, when it comes again to engaging uh, stakeholders, do you think that the laboratories and satellite activities are actually reaching the stakeholders, the communities we need to reach. So this is really a question now, if you like, about the format and the whole idea of those laboratories as part of the ocean uh, decade. Do you think it works? Well, unfortunately, I'm on a five-day cruise, so I wasn't able to, to attend all 31 satellite events. I wish I could have. Um, so it's hard for me to say, only based on my experience with the ones that I, I was in today, I would say no. And, and I, but I think that this is the start of that process. And, and with our event on engaging stakeholders, I think we just created a new niche. And, and I would say that, you know, we would request that, you know, the Ocean Decade Coordinating Unit call for projects that cut across the existing programs not just new programs. And, and then we can start actually getting the stakeholders we need into these meetings. Uh, we need to go out to the users. We need to go to the industry association meetings and the conservation community meetings. We need to insert ourselves into their professional communities and then bring them here and to be a part of these laboratories. 
Right, I mean, uh, uh, Jerome also, because uh, I mean, you were the, the, the first speaker here of those satellite activities, and it was certainly interesting to explore uh, this bridge uh, between uh, the science community and, and locals and the knowledge that they have uh, passed on from generation to generation. Uh, when you look at this kind of format, this kind of approach that the ocean decade is taking, uh, did you get some sort of feedback? Is, is this approach welcome? Is it helpful? Well, it will be up to us to make it helpful. But um, in, the, in the, Pacific, the, the Pacific community that regional organization I'm part of uh, is, has been building those bridges and that, doing that engagement uh, with the with the countries and with the stakeholders, uh, because you can't just sit back and, and, and wait until those stakeholders come to you. You have to go uh, see them. You have to go tell them, this is what we can do. This is what science can, can, can do for you. And then by exchanging, uh, by building those relationships with those stakeholders, uh, you can identify the gaps. You can identify the means to make your scientific products usable, uh, better tailored, uh, and to be successful at the end by um, having your st the stakeholders take up your product, take uh, ownership of them. So uh, relationship building is, is the most critical part to achieve in that uh, ocean decade. It's, it started and uh, hopefully it will continue and we'll get, we'll get there in 10 years. Who else? Yes, Mark, please. One of the experiences that we've had here in Denmark with developing these types of forecast products is, is that we shouldn't underestimate the power of jealousy. Um, it's very, very useful to actually have a, um, a forecast product that's, that's already out and working, even though it might not necessarily be perfect, um, because then it, it can actually acts as a, a, um, a focal point and makes it much, much easier to communicate it. Often in science, we talk about things very, very abstractly. When you come with a forecast product um, and show it to people, then they can actually start to say, oh, I'd like one of those for my particular fish stock. And, and that's very much something we've been trying to do here in, in, in Denmark is actually use very concrete examples as ways to motivate and get other stakeholders involved in the process as well. And I think I saw Martin's hand. There it is, Martin, please. Monica, uh, from my perspective, this format of the satellite has been, has been extremely exciting. And I can tell you why. The Cape Verdean community with the hackathon, they would have never done that without the impetus of these decentralized satellite labs. We would have never been able to get the blue economy experts flown to Berlin for a two-day event. Because we had it with the, with the private sector organized, organized by the private sector, that really got an engagement that in our traditional ocean science meeting, we could have not gone. And the exciting one of Tel Aviv was the person who explained to us what they do. She was looking for connections. She was looking for others who have the same problem. So that connectivity, I don't think we could have accomplished that in our more traditional setting that we all fly to some place on the planet and meet there for two days. So I thought for the three events that I was part of, new uh, partners were met. We had interesting excitement setups. And it was the decentralized aspect of it that made it so interesting for me. So I thought they worked great not to mention the carbon footprint that we uh, avoid this way. Uh, I just keep an eye on the chat now. So if you're OK, I would like to pass on one more question now from one of our participants. And uh, that's addressed to Mark. So Mark, do you think advancing fish forecasts could lead us to depleting fish stocks in the same way as we depleted fish stocks with development of industrial fisheries after World War II? It's a very good question and it's a very relevant question and there's no doubt that, that fish forecasting has the um, ability to... Oh, we would have loved to hear that, that answer, but Jerome, you, you jump in, maybe we can get Mark back. Jerome. Uh, thank you, Monica. So on, the, on that specific question, uh, as, you, as you may know, uh, the tuna in the Pacific uh, is a very key resource for many countries. And uh, accurate f fish forecasting, or in that case, quota, uh, is, is key to those countries because uh, they want to keep that, that resource you sustainable. So you need to be able to have uh, those predictions on 
uh, fish migration and, and fish quantity and where are they and how they and how they will evolve in the future. So it's, it's a key prediction and it's actually a key to maintain the sustainability of those fisheries. Uh, I see uh, David, please, your hands raised. Yes, I would just, uh, I, I agree with Jerome and, and I think the, 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 it's a valid question. I think uh, just like Jerome, it's really a matter of, um, of how those fish forecasts are, are gonna help us sustain those important fisheries understand human pressures on fisheries uh, and and how they're responding. We're seeing remarkable changes in the Arctic for where a lot of major uh, fish stocks are residing. They're, they're moving around in ways we've never seen before in response to the receding sea ice. And, you know, we need to be able to detect and forecast those movements in order to sustain. And, and as Jerome was indicating, uh, we have ways to uh, uh, manage those and set quotas and do other ways to manage fish, but we have to have some better intelligence about the ocean, about the fish and the biological responses. And uh, because you mentioned that, I mean, it's, it's also, uh, you have to build trust uh, in, in the prediction work you do. Uh, you need trust from the fisheries and the citizens who are all involved. Uh, how do we go about it? Are we in a good position there already or, or do we have to work on this trust building? Who is Martin? You go ahead. Monica, I think uh, trust is one of the key attributions of all we do. Uh, whatever we put out there, scientific opinions, forecasts, assessments, if you cannot trust what we do, we lost everything we've got. So that's the most important thing. But I think in the spirit of what we heard also, uh, Detlef reflecting on also, it's the co-design is here the key word. Because if we put these forecasts together with the fishermen who sometimes are interested in users, but often also provide data that allow us to do the forecast, then their trust building is almost built into the system because they're part of the system. But if we don't have the trust of the users or the contributors, we don't have anything left. Then it's all science fiction. And so I think that's really essential. And I think that is the main reason why Nick talked about the co-design and also David, because that's the trust building exercise. That's how we build the trust amongst those who produce the information and those who use and benefit from it. Okay, I just, yep, yeah, please, David. No, not David, Nicholas. <laughs> I got it. I agree with everything Martin. <laughs> I agree with everything Martin just said. And I would just say, yes, it's early engagement, as early as possible that you can bring the stakeholders in. And then it's not it, you, you co-design the systems with them, but then it has to be sustained and it has to be continuous engagement. And I think, you know, COVID-19 has you know put us in a very challenging position where we can't work with these people face to face. But hopefully when we come out on the other end, we can start having those conversations, building the, that trust and building those relationships. What I just wanted to say, I wanted to bring you up to speed. We have exactly three minutes as the clock is uh, ticking. Uh, I have one more question in the chat, which is for Jerome. So if anybody out there still has one more question, now is the time to sub submit it. Uh, and I would like to pass this one on to Jerome now. In case of the Arctic, the Indigenous Peoples Secretariat represents Arctic Indigenous Peoples in the Arctic Council. Is there a similar representation of Pacific Islanders in international organizations? And if not, would this be desirable? Well, that's a very good question, uh, more uh, in the political field than in the scientific field. But um, you could argue that in the Pacific, um, many countries are, are, are led by the indig indigenous people. So the, the small Pacific islands, um, they, they are themselves uh, the advocates of the traditional knowledge. So. And there are, um, there are regional organizations, they are both on the technical side and on the political side that can advocate for those indigenous rights. Uh, so maybe the situation is a little different in the Pacific. Hmm. Well then, uh, with the last minute sort of almost approaching, why not uh, close this Q&A, unless there is any urgent uh, question suddenly popping up, uh, with you once again, just basically your key takeaway from this particular ocean decade laboratory and the satellite activity you were involved in. What is it that you think is the most important uh, thought that you would like to keep with you? 
uh, starting with David. Sure, Monica, thank you. Um, very briefly, I think we've heard the word about co-development, and I think that's a critical component for all the reasons we talked about here, trust, capacity, uh, meeting the needs, future needs of our uh, society. So in my mind, we have to not only uh, speak the word co-development, we have to learn what it means in, in a practical sense and implement it to realize the vision we've set forth here. All right, and I just, just hear that we have Mark at least back on the phone. Mark, I don't know if you heard it. We're already in the last round with one question for all of you. Very briefly, uh, if you could put it in a nutshell, in a sentence, what is the key takeaway for you from this Ocean Decade Laboratory and in particular your satellite activity? Okay, we have the photo, but I cannot hear you. So we'll try again. Mm -hmm. There you are. Yes. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. The IT department decided it was going to reboot my computer in the middle of our presentation. Um, so that, that's our key takeaway to start with. <laughs> the scientifically, the, the main takeaway, I think, is that we have the tools and we can do this. We need to start to think about how we scale it up, how we start to roll this technology out now. Brilliant. Thank you, Mark, and apologies uh, that you just had such a short intervention now, but I'm glad we had you for most of the, the interview before that. Uh, Jerome, would you like to give us your key takeaway? Mm, my, 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 my key takeaway would be a, a wish that um, we can get all the uh, small Pacific islands uh, up to date and to speed uh, to a similar predictions that uh, uh, more developed countries uh, benefit from uh, in terms of modeling uh, because there are small dots in, in the ocean and modeling is harder to have for each individual islands. So my wish uh, for that uh, lab, from the lab and for the decade is to get the same level of prediction for all those small islands uh, than we have for large country, countries. Well, thank you, Jérôme, and I'll uh, head over to Nicholas before they uh, chase him away. He looks very busy where you are right now. So, Nicholas. Yes, thank you. Um, no, I would say my key takeaway is that we just need to look across the programs and think about how we can work together to be successful. This decade is going to require a tremendous amount of work, and we're the doers of the decade and we need to be coordinating and collaborating with each other to make sure that we're all successful. Brilliant. Martin, you have the final word. Thank you, Monica. I think from my perspective, it is the continued production of data, that is sustained observing systems, and the sharing of data and making that information available to all. That is the big challenge and my big hope, and I hope that the decade, and I'm sure the decade, will actually turn the corners and make that a reality. Fantastic. Um, sorry. I wish we had more time, but then in a review and in a wrap up of 48 hours, you have to sort of compromise here and there. But I think, thank you so much for, for the input you've, you've shared with us, and Nicholas Rome, Mark Ronald, Payne Larson, Emma, who would have been here. Instead, David Legler did a great job, thank you, and Martin Fisbeck, as well as Jérôme Aucan. Thank you to all of you. And with that, I very, very swiftly would like to hand over one more time to our Ocean Decade Laboratory, a predicted ocean co-chairs, Detlef and Craig. 48 hours, what's next? Thanks, Monica. Um, yeah, this is uh, really what's next. And, and in fact, we are in the wrap up, but uh, I, I do want to share what was it. I mean, this is, it's a wrap up of the laboratory, but in fact, it's a beginning of the ocean decade. So, I mean, whatever intense discussion we just had, we will continue now for a decade and, and be really successful. But this leads us, of course, to the question, the outlook um, at the end of this laboratory. Um, uh, outlook and expectations. What is actually the role of this laboratory? I mean, basically, we do have one laboratory, but of course, the, the question um, holds for all the laboratories. And I will start, and, and I will actually.